Okay, so welcome back, everybody. It's the Newcomers Community Forum. Today is April 29th. It is 2.05 p.m. Um, this week, we have Northeast Iowa Food Bank presenting on food assistance and the other um, uh, Cedar Valley food pantries here in Blackhawk County. So some solid resources for those of you who are interested in, in um, exploring food options locally, if that's a need that you have. Um, but at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Northeast Iowa Food Bank so y'all can get started. Hey there, I am Rhonda McBride. I'm the Service Insights Manager at the Northeast Iowa Food Bank. And in just a minute, I'll be talking about some of the programs that we provide, as well as uh, the pantry that we have here on site available for clients. So, um, but I'll go ahead first and let Lisa introduce herself. And Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Spittler, and I am the SNAP Outreach uh, Manager for here. Um, I'll be sharing a little bit more about my role and a little bit of a SNAP 101. So. So I started off here as the pantry services manager, and I got to work in the pantry with our clients, and we would see a lot of uh, individuals, different walks of life, and I know that is something that Tracy had mentioned, kind of, uh, we have different people with uh, different language barriers, different timing barriers, and all sorts of things, so um, we do have some options available uh, in the area for, for everyone. Um, first off, with the Northeast Iowa Food Bank, we do have a number of programs available to assist individuals. We have in our 16 county service area, mobile pantries, which go out into the communities and allow uh, families to get healthy, nutritious food and grocery supplies. And that's once a month. And we currently have 14 of those going. Um, we also have an elderly program where we're able to take nutritious food boxes to some of the housing facilities in the area to provide them with groceries. And we have backpack programs, which is probably one of our biggest uh, well-known programs in the area. Uh, we send out boxes that are pre-bagged groceries to send home with the children in their backpack. And that's gonna be ready to eat food, such as our like pop top, uh, cereal, granola bars, that sort of product. And that way they have some groceries over the food, uh, groceries over the weekend. Uh, to help them out. And then we also have our Kids Cafe program, which is where we send food to some of the different feeding sites throughout the week. And that allows them to have a meal, whether it be a late, late lunch or an early dinner to some of our sites. And that's at the help of the different school locations, also Boys and Girls Club. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I just, my brain, Salvation Army has one. So there's a couple of those throughout the community here in Blackhawk County. And then in the summer, we have our garden and that helps produce some items that come into the Cedar Valley Food Pantry that we are able to provide fresh fruits and vegetables to clients through the Cedar Valley Food Pantry. And then we also have our summer feeding program, which is very similar to the Kids Cafe, only on a summer basis. And that's also pretty, pretty nice to have those options available for the summer time. So in addition to the backpack, which is pretty popular and well-known in the Kids Cafe, we do have the Cedar Valley Food Pantry. And a lot of people do, when they think of the food bank, they think of the food pantry. The difference being is that the food bank is where we provide food to other pantries. Pantries then provide food to the people or the individuals. And so we have close to 150 partner agencies that we provide food to as a food bank. But here on site, we also have the Cedar Valley Food Pantry. And we have commodities that are provided to us through the USDA program, the Department of Human Services. And that gives us some of our food available. And then we also have donated food, we have retail rescue food, some of those garden products that I talked about earlier. And our pantry is open. We have five days a week that we're open to allow individuals to come in and their families. And we do have just a, a very short registration set up where we will ask them if they are at or below a certain income level. And basically, um, we do have a form here. Not, you can't read it, of course, probably from here, but it does have a little chart where we just look at their household size and make sure that they are at or below the income level listed for those TFAP products. And that stands for the Emergency Food Assistance Program. So if they're eligible for that, or if the child 
uh, any of the children in the home receive free or reduced lunches, then they would be eligible. If they receive SNAP benefits or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, they would also be eligible for our pantry. And with Waterloo, uh, all of the schools, as far as I know, still have free and reduced lunches, at least through the end of this year. I'm not sure how much further past that. Um, so that is something that we just have them fill out and verify. And we do that electronically, actually. We have a little key, a uh, little pad signature that they'll sign. And we just ask that they verify, you know, give us their name and address, phone number, that sort of thing, how many people are in their household, so that we can get some of those basic data points when we go to present for grants or if we need to uh, have that information for the bigger picture to show what the hunger situation is in our 16 county area as well as the state. So I know language barrier is a big thing. Uh, we do not have actual translators here on site, but we have worked with in the past uh, individuals at larger companies to provide information or to have sometimes when there have been fairs, you know, like resource fairs at businesses, we've been able to team up and have somebody maybe from the business who is a translator there for their employees. Uh, some of us do speak just enough Spanish to get us through and get some of the basic information. As far as other languages, we do rely a lot on things such as Google Translate. Uh, frequently, a lot of our populations um, coming in that may not speak English primarily will bring in someone as well, such as um, we have some that will bring in like a church sponsor who's helping them come to the area and they will be act as their translator. Um, so there are a couple different options. So if you know of anybody who does speak a foreign language, it is beneficial if they have somebody to assist them. But we can also get forms ahead of time to places if you know that there's a large population. Um, the TFAT form itself, we do have in I think seven different languages now. And so that's beneficial. And then the other forms are, very basic, again, the, the one other form that we electronically enter in, we have that in paper form as well, and we could easily translate, translate that probably um, with some of your assistants or, or someone who, who is also good at translation for that language. So that is, is a little bit of a barrier just, you know, because there are so many different languages spoken in the area, it is hard for us to have somebody on call all the time uh, for that. So. Any questions about kind of just the general, and I do have some hours and things like that that I can, can go a little bit further here in just a minute, but any questions so far? Just a couple detailed questions on uh, like the summer um, feeding sites. Is yes. there going to be information about that? Um, and if so, how can I get that information as to where the locations are, times? Yes, that is a great question. Uh, as we get closer to the summer, we will have a printout of that. And we do post it frequently on our Facebook page and different social media platforms, as well as on our Facebook, or excuse me, on our website, which is nbifb.org. And so that is something that we will put out there once we get that ready to go. And if um, a family needed the backpack program, how is that, how would they get assistance through that? That is also a good question. And that, since it is through the schools, they would just go to their school counselor, the guidance office, families, it's resource office, uh, depending on what it's called, just go to their local school building and talk to them there because they have coordinators at each of the buildings that we have that at. And then same for the kids cafe, um, they might call it something a little bit different, but if you have a child who is in an after school program, um, I'm trying to think of some of the schools, Pointer, Becker, Orange, some of those have different programs and they provide, some of them provide a morning snack or morning breakfast and an afternoon snack or a meal. And so for the school year, same thing, talk to somebody there at the school office and they should be able to let you know about that as well. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay, hey, you're welcome, Sarah. Um, as far as the pantry on site, uh, if somebody needs immediate food, they can come Monday through Thursdays from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. And we can go through those intake questions. And uh, then on Fridays from 9 to noon, we also have what's called the Produce and Perishables Pantry. Now, the Monday and Thursday, that is where somebody can come in once a month. So they can come in one time each month, Monday through Thursday, but then they can come every Friday from the 9 to noon for their produce and perishables. And that's usually about six to eight items. And that is, it's all indoors now. And so what we're doing is Monday through Thursdays, the clients will come in, check in, and they'll get their grocery cart and they'll kind of shop through the pantry. And then on Fridays, the grocery carts are pre-packed with those six to eight different items. They come inside, check in, take the cart out because it's already preloaded and then bring it back to the door. So um, that way it's nice and quick for everyone. And we also have the um, option, of course, if anybody ever uh, has volunteer hours that they need to put in or that they want to put in or give back to the community, we have a lot of different volunteer opportunities here, and that can be anywhere from riding on trucks uh, for, for those, of course, little older individuals, not so much school age, um, but it, sometimes it's the retail rescue, sometimes it might be helping in the kitchen or doing some office tasks, sometimes in the pantry or sorting through produce, helping in the garden. So that is something I know a lot of times we will get calls for people who are needing to complete it for a different school project or something along those lines. So there are a couple different different ways that they can help as well if they want to. And then of course, a lot of different ways for them to come in and get groceries and get some help for themselves if they need So I think that's probably, I covered most, most all of it, I think. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lisa now. Okay. Hello again. Um, so SNAP, Rhonda mentioned, is uh, the <clears throat> Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Previously in Iowa, this was uh, referred to as food assistance, and previous to that, it was called food stamps. A lot of times we still come down to, I get a blank look when I say SNAP, and then they'll say food stamps. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> so um, it is a program that you have to be eligible for in order to receive those benefits. I Sometimes one of the arguments I'll get from somebody, um, if we look and see if they are interested in, or if, or if it's appropriate for them to apply, and I might hear a phrase like, well, I don't want to take it away from somebody else who needs it worse. Um, and so one of my responses to that is, um, you have to be eligible for it. You're not taking it away from anyone. If you're eligible, then it's something that's there for you. So um, it is a process, but basically we're looking at households uh, generally that are 160% below federal poverty levels. So um, they have to apply for the program. Households will have to provide some documentation. Um, and that documentation could include things like their date of birth, their social security number, sometimes some citizenship information, um, and, and definitely the income of everybody who's in the household. If DHS decides that a household is eligible, and by the way, DHS is the only uh, person or group that can determine eligibility, um, and that is not something that I can do. But if DHS decides that they're eligible, they're going to receive something called the Iowa EBT card, and EBT stands for Electronic Benefit Transfer, um, and households can use that card uh, it'll be loaded once a month with whatever their, their benefit level is. And then that card looks and works like a debit card and can be used at grocery stores and, and convenience stores. So um, the monthly benefit levels are determined by DHS. They can be as low as uh, $20 possibly for a household of one or two people. And then it goes up from there. Um, the, the benefit level... Things that factor into that are number of people in the household and what the gross income level is and what certain um, expenses are that the household is having to cover. So, and then DHS kind of has their formulas that they reach a balance as to what that will be. 
SNAP benefits can be, are basically to be used for food and non-alcoholic beverages that are sold to be essentially eaten at home. So what that means is um, they can't be used for hot foods. So for instance, you can't go to a fast food place and use your SNAP benefits or, and things like in the grocery store, the hot rotisserie chickens, those wouldn't qualify for SNAP. Um, they're also not available to be used for paper products or hygiene products or over-the-counter medical or non-food items. But one of the additional things that they can be used for that I think is kind of neat as we think we're coming into spring, we hope, mm -hmm. um, is that you can use SNAP benefits to buy seeds and to do gardening. So that's a very helpful thing. So far, we've been talking about benefits that individuals and households can use, which is great. But one of the other things that I want to do is also lift, lift up benefits to the community. These, the SNAP dollars that they are spending is money that is going back into the local community and can really have an impact that way. So it's kind of good to keep that in mind. Um, now, the Iowa Food Bank Association we are not DHS, but we have a, a contract with DHS, and uh, that is to provide outreach and hotline staff and to be able to support and assist individuals to do the SNAP applications. Um, we know that there are a significant number of households out there that might be eligible, um, but have not applied for, for the program for a variety of reasons. And sometimes some of those reasons are just simply that they're overwhelmed. Um, so we try to really help at least get that application process to make it as smooth and easy as we can. Um, one of the things I'll often tell folks is, you know, if you go work with us, we'll, we'll help you. And I'm gonna talk about the hotline in a little bit, but it is easier than online and faster than paper. So <laughs> kind of keep those factors in mind. My role specifically is to do outreach. Um, I primarily focus on most of Eastern Iowa. I am a shared staff person between Northeast Iowa Food Bank, based here in Waterloo, um, HACAP, based out of Hiawatha and Cedar Rapids area, and Riverbend, based, on, based out of Davenport. So altogether, that puts me in 28 counties. Um, my, my role is kind of divided into a few areas of things that I try to focus on when I'm doing outreach. I usually start with direct outreach, meaning I go to pantries, mobile pantries, congregate meals, resource fairs, any place that I think I might be able to meet or come across or talk with folks who might be eligible or who might be interested in applying. I can offer to help them do the application myself. Pre-COVID, I would bring my computer and sit down with them and do it. Um, at this point, I still just get their information and I do a phone application with them. I will find out when they're available and I will follow up with them and we'll get that application in. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm trying to give information. And I, again, you're not gonna be able to read this, but just to get the concept, um, getting these brochures or flyers out. These are uh, SNAP hotline flyers is what we call them. Um, it basically starts out with the question, is your grocery budget tight? We've got a little graph that again, like the TFAP form looks at household size and what your gross monthly income is. And one of the things I can tell people is, you know, I can't tell you if you're eligible or not, but I can tell you when it certainly makes sense to apply. And that's how we, and we don't know until you actually do the, the application. Down here on the, on the card, this is where we have the Iowa SNAP hotline phone number. And what we want to do is get folks to call <clears throat> into that number. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> um, but yeah, we want, we want folks to call that number. And we have a staff team of Iowa Food Bank staff who we've got six, about six folks, um, both full-time and, and part-time that are on that hotline. And literally we are doing the application with them. Um, we, we walk them through it, talk them through it. And while we're on the phone with them, we get it into DHS. So it's that's one nice thing is, is to kind of be reassured that yes, your application is in. We see the question. Arlene's got a question about the SNAP hotline flyers. Um, can they be put in a rack at church for folks to grab? They can. Um, I have some other posters that might work better for that. Uh, these, this particular flyer is especially helpful when you're sitting and, and talking with folks to be able to tear it off and give them that one. Um, I have, let's see, I don't think I have it in here with me. 
I have some other posters that can also be posted and some tear offs that they could take and that would be incredibly appropriate and sometimes the tear offs are nice to put in places that are a little um, private, more private for some for those that feel uncomfortable being seen taking the information. So, but good question. Um, so yeah, so that we do a lot of direct outreach focus. Um, another area that we're trying to do as much as we can would be providing some education and updates somewhere on what's happening with, with the hotline or with SNAP, excuse me, I, I just read the question <laughs> at the same time. The hotline is not 24 seven. The hotline is Monday through Friday, eight to five. And then I always tell folks that if you get voicemail, leave your contact information because we do call back. So it just means everybody's on a call. <laughs> so good, good, thank you for that. So back to the education part um, with SNAP. An example of education, um, many of you probably are aware of that April, two years ago, April is when the state of Iowa, because of COVID, declared emergency status. When that state of emergency went in place, everybody who received SNAP benefits went from getting what their normal benefit level is to getting maximum household benefit. So February 15th, that uh, state of emergency was ended here. We've had our month of grace period. April now, as of April, everyone, when they got their SNAP benefits, went back to whatever their normal benefit level is. So that's been kind of the biggest education piece we've been trying to share and prepare folks for. For some people, that's a very significant difference um, to what they are. Some people, it's not quite as significant, but so helping to people to plan for that and to know to kind of watch their card to make sure they're getting, that they know what their level of benefit is. So um, the third area that I really do a lot of is networking. And so I'm trying to get out and talk to various folks with uh, a variety of organizations, kind of like we're doing here, um, to let them know about the hotline, let the, get them materials about that, and let them know that I'm also available to come to their sites. Um, could be sometimes it's clinics, hospitals, veterans affairs, just really the whole range of organizations. Um, so. Yes, we can. I'm, sorry. That. <laughs> I'm going to keep going and we'll do do more of the questions at the end here, I think. So it's a little smoother. Um, one of the things that I talk to folks is, is as you're working in various organizations, right there on the spot, you are the trusted voice with that particular household. And so if it's something, if we can do the application with them and hit one, take that off your plate to do with them. And number two, that you can recommend that to them um, in a reliable way, that that could be very helpful for them. And again, it's as simple as you're hearing that they're having some, some crises or, or you think it might help them stabilize a little bit, tear off the flyer. And I really think you should call this number, it's, you know, and that is incredibly helpful. So I would, if anybody would like those materials, I would be more than happy to get those materials to you. I literally have them in the back of my car and they go everywhere with me. So, um, and I can either drop them off in person or get them in the mail, just depending on how long it will be there. Um, we've talked a little bit about the hotline, but like I said, it's about six staff who are part-time and full-time. Um, we do that whole application with them over the phone. A typical one or two person household might take us maybe 20, give or take 20, 25 minutes to do the application. Um, and again, if we get it into DHS immediately while we're talking to them. We do have a Spanish specific line. So when folks call that hotline number, there is a prompt that if you would like the Spanish line, um, we will do that. And then we do also have a translator service available to us. So there are many languages in Iowa, um, and we do our best then to get that hooked up and, and get that to work. So in general, that's kind of SNAP 101. Um, I thought it might be helpful. We, we don't, we can track how many applications that we do and we, we track it by county in Iowa. So just as an FYI so far, as we just finished in our third quarter of the year with our fiscal year starting in July, um, Blackhawk County specifically has had 407 applications um, and more to come. So 
Sometimes literally our hotline line is backed up as we are taking calls constantly. Um, but we just kind of get through that process. We also try to coach folks on what to expect after the application gets in uh, so that they know what to watch for. For instance, DHS needs to do, a, usually does a follow-up phone interview with folks. So we kind of give them a clues as to that and try to help them anticipate what they might be asked for um, just to help get that process going. Now, any more questions? <laughs> I have a question actually, just to clarify from when I was in the pantry, um, we would have people who would say, I'm only getting the bare minimum and it might not be worth my time to fill out the paperwork. Is it true that there may be other benefits available if they actually go on SNAP? Yes, there are. Um, being, being on the SNAP program could make you eligible for other types of programs. Uh, there is a program that runs at some of our grocery stores, and I always mess the name up, but it's Double, double Up Food Bucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that is a great example of if you are if you use your SNAP EBT card for the stores that are participating in the program, if you use that card to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables, for every dollar you spend that day, up to $10 worth, when you get go check out at the register, you're going to get coupons for however many dollars worth of vegetables you bought so you can double up what you purchased. I think that's fairway, I think. Some fair some it changes. Fairways? It okay. changes. Some, so some there are some fairways, some high V's. Okay. It, the program was originally built around the farmers market. So they're trying been trying to get it to be year round. Funding has been an issue. So that's where some stores are participating and some are not. But it's worth checking it out. And then I also put a note in the chat. Um, just so I didn't forget, <laughs> um, is that some people will come in to a pantry situation, they'll say, well, I don't get SNAP benefits, so I'm not, you know, they'll come in with a friend, they'll say, so I'm not eligible. Well, just because you're not getting SNAP benefits does not mean that you are eligible. Uh, there is, in fact, a gap. I mean, the eligibility requirements for SNAP might be here, and your income might be here, and that's okay because our guideline is up here. So there is going to be that gap of individuals who may not be getting the one benefit, but could be eligible for pantry under the TFAP guidelines. And they can, those who are getting SNAP can still go to pantries yes. as well. Yes, so. it's not one or the other exclusively. Right, right. <clears throat> and I will be glad to put my email and phone in. Thank you. <laughs> this is Arlene again. I have a question about once someone has applied for SNAP, and they are getting their EBT, what is the renewal process or how do they, like, is it like, do they have to do it monthly, yearly, or, you know, like, let's say they're still in the same spot a year later, do they just continue it or do they have to reapply? How's that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, especially because if somebody tells me that they lost their SNAP benefits, probably eight or nine times out of 10, it's because they did not do their renewal process. Either they didn't get the paperwork, that, that I've heard that quite often, or they didn't get their paperwork back into DHS in time. So when, when that happens, they do get cut off, we need to reapply them. And again, we just pick up and jump in and do that application. In terms of how often they, they have to do that renewal, that's up to DHS, and it does vary a little bit. Um, I've heard a lot of folks getting a renewal within three months, six months, a year. They do have to do, I think, minimally a year because uh, they have to confirm that income and, and that they're appropriate levels um, because some people pick up an extra jobs or lose jobs. Um, and kind of a, another note on that, when folks say, oh, I've, uh, I applied for SNAP, but I got denied. Um, a lot of times I'll ask, well, when did you last apply? And it's like, oh, it was a year ago or four years ago or something like that. <laughs> <Arlene>. <laughs> um, I hear that often. Snap I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Snap I was like, oh my God. Definitely go through a review process and usually increase on the federal fiscal year level. So every October, those guidelines do change. Um, but again, that individual's income and number of people in their household, all of those things could be factors that influence whether they're eligible or not. So often what I, my answer is, you know, it never hurts to reapply. Let's give that a shot and see. 
um, and go from there. Okay, so another question I have, I do work with the immigrant and refugee population here in Waterloo and Cedar Falls and actually across the state, but um, so my, my question is for them, if, if the, a question comes up, um, you know, I, I mean, I, and I didn't get to be on the very beginning of your, your presentation, so you might have, might have covered this. So for them, let's say they are not citizens yet. Does that make a difference at all? If they're, if they're refugees, they're already here. But if they're not, you know, I mean, I know we have sort of a population around here that are not, uh, they're not refugees. They're not, well, they're immigrants, but they're not, they're not, uh, well, what am I thinking of? Um, they're migrant workers or they're, there might be people that don't have any papers to be here in the United States. How does that work for you guys? Basically, um, yes, citizenship is an issue. However, where some people in the household might not be eligible because they are not citizens or they haven't been here long enough, there's a variety of factors in there. In many of those cases, they might have had children who were born here. Their right. children may be eligible, even though those uh, the adults might not be. Oh, so. okay. Okay. And then here at the pantry, uh, we do not have any requirements for your residency status. You okay. know, as long as you are in, you know, in Iowa, a, re a resident of Iowa to participate in the Iowa emergency food emergency. Oh. It's Friday afternoon, guys. Chief uh, right. program. <laughs> um, as long as you're an Iowa resident, you're able to get that. Um, you know, we have, like you said, migrant workers who come in. We have people who may not be here um, legally per se, and right. there is a concern for them. They are very concerned and very, very almost scared to come in. And right. we tell them we don't report that information. We don't ask for social security numbers. We don't ask for naturalization papers or anything like that um, at the pantry. Now, some pantries, because there are a number of pantries and, and meal services throughout, um, they may have county guidelines. So for example, even the pantry here on site, it's intended for Black Hawk County, but if we have somebody who lives in Bremer, but they work in, in Black Hawk, we'll serve them that one time and then refer them to their local pantry. But Residency, as far as naturalization, citizenship, social security numbers, we're not we're not getting into that. <laughs> so, what, so at the pantry, do they? So at the pantry, when they come, like for the first time, do they have to like show where they're living, like a, a piece of mail, or do they not need anything? Not nope. need anything. Perfect. They they okay. need to be able to tell us their name and their address. Okay. How many people are in their household, and make sure that they're at or below that income level listed. That is the bare minimum. Uh, the other questions that we will ask may include things such as, you know, what's your current marital status? Um, and we will ask for family members' names and dates of birth as well, ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Those are optional, but it's again so that we can then <coughs> provide data back to places that are providing money to us to help feed people. Uh, we don't ever look at it on the individual level. It's more of that aggregate data that we look at that for but they don't have to bring us any paperwork or anything. Sometimes it's helpful for spelling of names or anything like that, but it's not required. We won't turn someone away. That's awesome. That's good stuff. <laughs> I, I know I was working with a family a while back and that was a concern of theirs. Like they were needing assistance, but they were worried about um, like they were in the citizenship process and they didn't want to thwart anything and that kind of situation. So that's really cool that that's an option. Yeah. Lisa and I actually worked in the, the pantry together for a couple of years, year and a half or so. And I think that was one of the things she hit on earlier with SNAP benefits even is the, it almost breaks your heart when you hear people say, I don't need it anymore. You know, I, I don't need it. This other family needs it more than I do. And we, same thing here at the pantry. I mean, it breaks our heart when we see people who say, no, I don't need it as bad as that other person. Or, you know, I, I'm scared to come in because of my citizenship status. And it's like, come in, we, we don't want you to be hungry. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's, 
I think we're very passionate about that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, please come in. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Danya, did you have something to add? Oh no, I, well, they kind of like mention it, but so it doesn't matter if like somebody's living in Iowa, like temporarily, you can still assist. For the pantry? Um, yes, uh, we, we do have, um, Probably every summer we get a group of individuals who are migrant workers who come and they are, you know, needing assistance. And so typically there is a worker with whatever company is sponsoring or whatever farm is sponsoring that group. They'll come in and help us with translation. And that way we're able to get those individuals food. So yeah, as long as it's, you know, as long as they are living in Iowa um, at the time of service, then there's, there's nothing wrong with them getting assistance. Uh, one thing I will say though is, and sometimes we do see this as, I don't wanna say a, a, an issue, but it happens that we serve by address. So Tom, sometimes we will see, uh, especially with the immigrant population, you might have one family staying in a home and then they have another family coming from their, their country of origin. And there are actually two different families living in one household. We serve by the address. So if you're all at 120 Main Street and it's two different households actually living in one address, we serve you once a month, plus then that every Friday produce and perishables pantry. So that might be different than say SNAP benefits, which yeah. can be confusing for individuals but the TFAP program is based on address and, and that is that address is your household. So with SNAP, the way it's looked at is if you live with say a roommate or, or others in the household, essentially if you buy your food together and share your food together, you are one household. So then you, you need the information for everybody in that household. If you say you, it's two roommates and you each buy your food and, and prepare your food separately, you can each be separate households, but we would have to show that the other person is in the physical house. We just don't apply for them. And right. so again, some of the, the families that citizenship <clears throat> might not work for as easily, um, you know, we might need to show the, the parents as in the household, but we wouldn't apply for them. We would apply for maybe the kids that could be eligible. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely understand that part. I was having difficulty um, because I serve Asian and Pacific Islanders um, with monsoon. And so I know Micronesians are not eligible for SNAP. I've already tried it with my client. And so I'm just glad to be a part of this meeting because there are other benefits than SNAP or whether they're not eligible for SNAP, they can still have other benefits. And so, um, it'll be great to, you know, just have, do outreach with both of you. And then I serve 99 counties in Iowa, but our, um, <laughs> our, our office is in Des Moines, Iowa City and Dubuque. And so we're trying, I'm just trying to learn more, you know, connections, add more connections and learn more benefits that I can, you know, hopefully assist the communities that we and Danya, I, I work with a uh, Dubuque Food Producers Network who are very interested in reaching out to that particular community. So just to be aware of that, um, they would like to try to do that. If you could email me your contact information, I would like love to kind of connect you in there if you're, if you're comfortable doing that. That'll be lovely. I'm gonna put it in the chat for you actually. And also related on that, possibly, I'm not sure, um, but there is the Embark program in Waterloo, and they work with the Burmese population. And I know on occasion, uh, they have uh, had a representative from Embark come in along with some of the individuals they're representing. And so they've kind of done like a little private tour of the pantry. And that's not something we do a lot, but at the same time, um, we have been able to do that on occasion and give them that little bit of comfort level instead of just coming in cold by themselves without any assistance right. otherwise. So 
and looks like Arlene is actually at Embark, so. Uh, <laughs> That'll be great. That'll be all, like, that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks. Thank so, you. I have a couple more questions, sorry. Uh, one is, I, I, I probably, because I got in here a little late, the pantry is in the food bank, is that right? It's just part of it? That is correct. The okay. entrance is off of uh, right. Lafayette. It's at 1605 Lafayette. Yeah, I know and where it's at. Yeah. When you come into the main building, so you you come in, there's the vestibule area. Right. It's the first door is the pantry lobby. Okay. If you go past that door, that's the offices. Um, and one thing on that, if you ever have people calling you and saying, well, I tried to go to the pantry and they were closed. But the internet says they're open until 4.30. Uh, it is true. If you Google, I think Cedar Valley Food Pantry, it will take you to the NEIFB hours. And the hours that are listed are Monday through Thursday, 7.30 to 4.30. That's the office that's 7.30 to 4.30. Mm. And on Friday, it is 7.30 to 2. And the, that's just for the food bank offices. Um, the pantry itself, as I mentioned, and, and Arlene, since you might not have been in here, the pantry hours are Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Okay. And then Friday from 9 until noon. Great. We frequently get calls at the main office saying, but your internet said. You uh, know. Yeah, but that's got to be confusing. Yes, I would think. actually on our website, they, it, they have got it on the front page of the website pretty right. well laid out. So okay, yeah. good. It's the difference is the Northeast Iowa Food Bank versus Cedar Valley Food Pantry. Yes, and a lot of times people just look it up in Google and stop at the little Google sidebar. Sure. They don't actually go to our web page. Yeah. So then, then it just all becomes your internet said this or your page. <laughs> my, my other additional question is, when I know when our, our, you know, Burmese, Congolese, any of our refugees come here to Waterloo, mainly Waterloo or Cedar Falls, um, I know Catholic Charities in the past has been, you know, like when they first come, okay, we got like 90 days and Catholic Charities has that 90 day period where they're trying to get them housed and they're trying to do that. Do you guys, do they work with you guys so they are aware that you're even there or not? You know, I'm, I can't speak on, on that behalf. Um, I mean, it's quite likely they know of us. I mean, we are a part of, um, and I should say, the Northeast Iowa Food Bank is a part of a larger uh, right. basic needs committee that is in the Cedar Valley area. Yeah. And so I do know that we have frequently had people come in and, again, with a representative from, whether it be Catholic Charities or from uh, different kind of a facility. So, but to what extent I, I just can't confirm. Okay. There's so much good information. I think that the biggest thing that like, you know, I'm taking away is the fact that you're you, specific to the food pantry. It's like, you don't turn people away. Like you're, you're doing your best to accommodate. And I think that's huge because like when it comes to food, like food is like the equivalent of brain health, right? Like we all need food to survive. And, and it's, it's just, it's such a big deal. And then it just, when you're hungry, like you're not going to do well, <laughs> like, nice. because your brain's not thinking straight. And like, I get angry when I'm hungry personally, that's my go time. <laughs> I'm that person. But, um, but yeah, that's just so huge. And just that correlation between those two things, I think is very important. Absolutely. Um, I also, I think it's really cool. The, the fresh fruits and vegetables option. And then that the double up food bucks thing. That's really cool. I didn't know about that yeah. prior to this. So that's awesome. You guys are doing amazing work. So I, I see the trucks sometimes when I'm like driving, you know, with the, like the orange logo the orange on the side. Truck. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I know that. It's awesome. Yes. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, Julie, do you have years, anything? I still, get, uh, I still get a smile when I see those trucks around town. Yeah. In, in any of our counties, I mean, I, I'll be up by the Wisconsin border or Minnesota border. I'll mm -hmm. be like, Oh, look, there goes one of our trucks. Yeah. <laughs> like I work far. there. <laughs> yeah. We go That's that awesome. far. That's incredible. Really. Julie, did you have anything to add today? Uh, not really, but uh, I just want to ask one more question. I think uh, Arlene um, asked a question, but I want just to, can you hear me? 
Yes. Oh, okay. So it's about uh, parents who are undocumented and that has kids who was born here. So if you can explain to me how they can apply for food stamp because we tried and it didn't work because they didn't have no documents. So how can they proceed? Um, I would say give it a shot again because sometimes it depends on who you end up working with a little bit. Um, but yeah, we would, we would have to show that the parents are in the household, but we wouldn't apply for them. So they wouldn't need, I wouldn't think they would ask for as much documents on the parents, but you not, might need some documents on the children. Okay. Um, and that would be up for DHS to specify what they would need. I always recommend when DHS asks, because DHS does a follow-up, so an interview with all the, anybody mm -hmm. who applies. Yeah. And when they do that, um, I always recommend try to ask DHS to be specific on, on what documents you need and how to get it to them and what address so, so that we can you can facilitate that process. Um, because getting whatever documents they ask for is a crucial part. Yeah, we will try. Um, it's a little bit hard to work with DHS too. As immigrants, I have experience. Uh, I'm Julie from the Congolese community and I work for the health department as a community health worker. I'm trying to help a lot of people like to apply for the services. I think it's a little bit harder, especially when you call the caseworker, they don't answer the phone. They may ask you to leave the message, but the person I'm helping don't speak English. So even if I leave a message and you call back, you're gonna call back in English. So you won't be able to speak to that person. So, and usually they don't call back, excuse me to say this. So it's a little bit hard to work with DHS. Yeah. I'm gonna suggest maybe try to use the hotline because again, we have the translating services on the hotline and then we can also indicate on their application what language um, they need. Um, if that, I don't know if that will help. Having struggled reaching the caseworker, I um, even those who are not immigrants, that it's a common struggle for folks. And part of it is just case, caseload that DHS is working with. Um, but I, I agree with you. I, I know it is a process and not an easy one. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Julie. I've been in that same situation, even working with you when you were with Embark too. Yeah. And and my guess would be if if the parents, you know, do do the application and you know the kids are born here, let's just say everything ideally goes well. I'm assuming that since the kids are not working, that they would give them the highest amount. Or SNAP or not? Again, it depends on whatever income is in the household, oh. and whatever, um, how many people are in the household. Because I mean, technically, I mean, if you're technical about it, the kids are applying, they're not, they're not employed. So technically, the way I look at it is they should be getting the most amount, even though their people maybe are employed, but they're not the ones that are applying. But I, I know it sounds weird, but no, I, I hear you. I, I, I always have to kind of turn this over because it's not something that I can influence. It's a DHS decision in there and however they apply their formula. Is there a specific person at DHS that like I could reach out to to potentially do something like this in the future to kind of, or that we could facilitate something to, um, I guess, improve the uh, communication within the immigrant refugee population and the like benefits system? That you know that'd that'd be great. I can pass your contact information onto my contact. That would be wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I can't guarantee sure. what will or won't happen. And again, yeah. some of it is just simply caseload. Mm -hmm. um, that right. With, and I think that's a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I've heard that express that this is an interest that they would like to be doing mm -hmm. more and better with. Mm -hmm. Um but everything is a process. Sure, right. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the large reasons that we that this community forum was started too was just to kind of give the immigrant refugee population like more of a voice within the community specific to connecting to resources to be like, hey, like we have this this population of people who are interested in these resources. We just need to figure out a way to um, address the communication barriers and get these resources a bit more accessible to people. And um, yeah, but I, I understand it's a process, so. But yeah, I'd appreciate I'll anything. Also, to say this is an area that 
I do not know as much about of sure. it, of many of the areas of when I help people apply. Mm -hmm. I am not as knowledgeable for immigrants and, and refugees. Sure. Um, and have been asking for more. Yeah. Info. And you're, you're both welcome to attend future meetings that we have here. It's just a nice opportunity to connect with the immigrant refugee pop and just kind of discuss like what, what, um, what topics are um, of interest to them. And then also like how we can all kind of move forward within the community together. That's, that's a large part of what we're doing here. So, but yeah, this has been wonderful you all are doing, you're, you're doing the Lord's work. This is great stuff. There's so so many things happening. I know with COVID and the pandemic that you you had to learn like as with everyone just navigating different avenues to get ac people food and access to that. That's it's been a trip, man. <laughs> Gonna sake. But yeah, okay. So it's almost three o'clock. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm gonna stop recording at this time.